So um, one thing I would say is um, I just make it a little bit bigger. <clears throat> if we look at the uh, schedule here. That um, everything is already up. Let me go ahead and refresh this. There we go. Everything is up for today. I'll walk you through this in just a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about these future meetings. Um, uh, people have been um, pretty forthcoming up to now and keeping that weekly meet going. Um, but we're up to a point where we have a few volunteer slots for the next few weeks. What I'll probably do is um, send out uh, in an email, right, maybe after today or tonight or something, and um, just remind people that I'd like a few volunteers. If you've given um, a volunteer um, presentation in the last few months, let's say, you know, somebody else should be able to stand up and, and do this. And I, I want to stick to it that I do about one per month. So if people want to um, to do it every week, um, yeah, we will need to keep the volunteers coming. I can think of some alternatives that we could do. So if you would like to volunteer and maybe just go through a tutorial or maybe just talk about a problem and do some live coding, um, that would be appropriate. But uh, email me uh, or respond to the email that I send up after this because we'll need a few. I thought um, Matt, probably this meeting number 99, maybe we could do uh, something with the uh, maybe you could present or we together could present something on either the moths. Uh, that's probably a little ambitious to have that together by then. Or maybe the black vine weevil, uh, maybe something um, structured and maybe something also to motivate the publication. Uh, yeah. on it's not R. I'll bring that straight up. It's, it's Python, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm to... But now that I look at the meeting tw the, on the 28th, that's the week I mentioned earlier that I won't be here. So maybe we could push it back to the following week. Um, anyway, um, that's what is happening in the future. What we're doing today. Let me just verbally uh, introduce and describe it. Is that uh, I've made a few changes to the boot camp. Um, and I, I plan some more changes. Um, the cycle for the summer um, boot camp where applicants to the data science um, course for international students, we've been through that cycle and it's finished now. Um, but for the domestic students, the cycle will come um, in the next uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, maybe the next six weeks or so. Well, um, what I will probably do for all of my modules. Some of you will be interested to hear this possibly. Uh, including the boot camp as a modules, I'm going to migrate them all 100% to dedicated um, institution GitHub repositories so that I can invi invite um, assistant lecturers, my colleagues, PhD students that are interested to them, and not be constrained by building these things on uh, on Moodle that, that I don't have control over. So I'm going to go in a bigger way in that direction. Um, and I'll, I'll probably do it over the next few weeks for everything. Probably start with the boot camp. But uh, one of the things I want to think about is how to assess the boot camp. In the past, I have um, given a, a one hour in person interview. It's very thorough. I'm able to exactly tell what the person is capable of and how much they've engaged with the boot camp, which both of which are a, a contingency for um, coming in and starting the data science masters if you don't have a first degree in math programming or statistics. This year I decided I didn't have enough time. There were too many um, applicants for me to give an hour and to take care of all the um, the scheduling for that. And so instead I made a quiz. And the quiz is uh, on the honor system. This is what it looks like. I'll just um, before I come to that, I'll just um, like I usually do drop a link to the um, Perig page in the chat. And then I'll also drop a, uh, if you'd like to look at it in front of you, I'll drop a link to this, this PDF of the quiz. Now this is the quiz 
I decided to share it with you guys because I will retire this version of the quiz now and, and tweak it and make a new version for the second half of the summer. And uh, what I do when I administer this quiz is I give it to the students and it's it's completely enclosed um, and contained within the boot camp material and all of the questions. There are 10 questions. Um, they're all fairly straightforward and they're they're all they're all it's open book. It's 24 hours from the time I send it until the time that I expect the one R script to be come back. I'll just read through the um, instructions with you uh, in as far as what I send to the students. The first one is that it uh, covers material in the boot camp and I give a reminder link, but they should have already worked through the boot camp. A second um, is that um, it requires the use of uh, RNR Studio and it, it's open book. A lot of my assessments, I like to be open book because the way that I work with R, the way that you work with R, and you know you've all seen me work, um, sometimes you can't know everything and you have to consult a reference. So it's a very natural way um, to have a quiz, to have an open book one. So you're encouraged. I encourage you to use notes, the bootcamp webpage, or anything else. But I do say that there's an honor system so that you don't collaborate. Of course, we could collaborate today. We're going to start it real quick. I give a um, specify the deliverable for the quiz. It's just a plain R script um, that's named your dash name dot R. And the example I give is for mine would be named Ed dash Harris, all, all capitals. Uh, and you just return the quiz to me um, at my Harper email within 24 hours. And uh, any questions or anything can be raised in Slack. And then I have the questions. Well, what I plan for us to do today is for you to take this quiz. And you can start right now. We're going to do this for 30 minutes. Now, at the time that you do it, I'm going to be doing live coding. I've already answered the questions, obviously, because <laughs> so I wrote them too. But I'm going to live code at the same time. I'm not going to narrate. I'm going to let you answer them on your own. See how many you can get through. It's probably not enough time to finish them all, but you can start. Any questions or comments before we begin? If not, um, you can see how I intend people to um, to take the quiz, and I intend them to take it, you know, side by side like this. So um, I'm not going to to narrate my my uh, answering of the questions. So uh, I'll just let you work at your own pace. You can watch me answer the first few questions. And then at about, um, let's say, 4.35, I'll stop and I will narrate answers to the questions that I've already made. Does that sound OK? Thumbs up or yes or no, or just unmute and yell if um, there's an issue. Otherwise, you can just watch me. I'm going to start um, trip now. Okay, good. <clears throat> so here I go. I'll just highlight the uh, question that I'm on as I go through it.
about halfway through. Everybody doing OK? You just joined. We are um, taking a little quiz, a little skill quiz. There's the link to the quiz. You can just start. We're going to start going through the answers in about 10 minutes. <clears throat> I'm just coding my own answers to the questions. You can watch me, but I encourage you to answer a few of the questions. <clears throat> Okay, for this one, we have to refer to figure one. So we're going to make a figure identical to figure one with that data. There's figure one. I'll just leave that there.
Number seven. Okay, figure number eight refers to figure below. Refers to this figure. So let's read the question. Based on figure two below, relate in comments the degree to which you believe the Excel data set shown adheres to tidy data standards. Be brief, but be as specific as you can. I will um, just scroll to the picture while we do that.
for nine. Still have enough time. I'm going to go ahead and answer this one. Okay, we're at uh, 435. <clears throat> what, uh, how many questions did everybody answer? You can just put them in the chat or you can yell it out. I got to nine. The last question is, um, is to make a GitHub repository and make this, this picture. <clears throat> So you saw me do it in real time. Or OK, not bad. That's pretty good. <clears throat> Shall I walk through the uh, the answers and my thinking on these and. Um, and such. 
I think I'll just do that. All right, so um, the first uh, question is to start a reproducible script for the assessment. What I'm kind of looking for here is to um, is to um, make a header, put in the basics, uh, and create some clickable sections as we go along. There was the instruction also to make the subsections um, be clickable according to um, to um, uh, those standards that we covered in the in the um, uh, the boot camp. And I did it for pretty consistently till the very end. Okay. So just that setup and keeping up that setup is what I was looking for there. Um, question two, show the R code to reproduce the following output. The output was a matrix that looks like this down here. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see. Um, so what we need to do with this is it's a, you know, give a little tip of the name that it's a matrix with uh, the name of the data object, my mat. I'm gonna go ahead and nuke these results as we go through this. So I give a little hint with that, whoops, but I need to make it. Um, so what I do is I use the matrix function. Um, I noted on the PDF that, um, I just make that a little bit bigger. I can just alt tab between these. I noted that um, the columns have names and the rows have names. So I just made a vector with these numbers using the matrix function. Um, but I knew I needed them to be in the correct order. So I set the number of rows to two and I had the filling of those rows um, by row just based on the way that I did it. Of course, there are other ways to solve this. And when I run that, then I get a, and you saw me, I don't know if you guys were watching me, if you were answering your own questions, but um, I didn't just type all this stuff out all at once. I was testing my own code. This is equivalent to a, you know, when you get to a certain age like me, what you get excited about is food. And I watch chefs on TV a lot. And, you know, one of the, basic things you learn is you taste what you're cooking constantly. And you may have noticed that, uh, you know, made the matrix, right? Okay, yeah, the matrix looks correct. Then I wanted to add um, names to it. Well, I exploited the row names function that contains the names. At the moment, there are no names on my humble little matrix, null. And so I put the names in and I put them in in the order that I want them. So we can check that. Now we can print my matrix got the rows and if we just ask for the row names back boom we get the names that I just put in it do the same thing for the columns dog and cat my mat female male dog and cat question three go ahead and close that show the R code to make a good histogram of the following data describing the height in centimeters of domestic cats at the shoulder and I go ahead and give the data. It's already combined. And I even say the name of the data object. So you could type this in, but that would not be the easiest way to do it. And also, it opens you to mistakes. You should do copy and paste um, for data. And so when we run that, we get our um, data object popping up. And uh, by good histogram, what do I mean? I mean that it should have some axis labels. If we just, you might have noticed that I did actually build up the histogram by um, printing the default, making sure the data looks okay and nothing weird with the data. But, um, you know, let's put some axis titles on it. I give the, uh, in the question, what kind of data it is, what units it's measured in. Um, and of course that's what's measured in the X axis and then the count of cats. Uh, on the y axis. And uh, of course, by good figure, I meant liberal use of the color goldenrod, my favorite R color as well. <clears throat> so this would be, you know, the kind of answer I'm looking for. Question four 
Using the same cat data object in the previous question, perform the Shapiro test to decide whether the data adhere to a Gaussian distribution. Show your R code to do this, and also in comments, report and briefly interpret your results in the technical style. So this is the kind of thing that I go through for almost every test that I go through in the in the um, whole boot camp. Uh, the Shapiro test is very easy to perform. And uh, for every statistical test, as I, I really hammer at home every time I get the chance to talk about it, for every single hypothesis, we um, need to report three values. The test statistic for Shapiro test, that's the Shapiro's W. The p-value, of course, if it's a null hypothesis testing appropriate test, and the either the sample size or the degrees of freedom. So my re full reporting of this is uh, there is no evidence the cap height data is distributed differently to Gaussian Shapiro test. Shapiro's W equal to 0.96, N equal 40, P equal 0.13. Remember what we're testing for this and other similar tests is whether there is a difference and if there is, your data aren't Gaussian. Usually we would apply this to residuals, but you know we can apply it here as well. If we look at the data, actually, I could ask lots of follow-up questions, but really this is just the point of this is just to you know gauge whether there's been engagement with the material. And even if you don't keep it in your mind, that um, you can refer to the pages and access the material there. But I could have asked a follow-up question about uh, this because it's not very Gaussian looking. Um, and maybe to ask why, why our test results it is not different to Gaussian, but actually it looks bimodal like there are two lumps. And um, the reason for that is possibly that a lot of these yes or no null hypothesis tests for Gaussian um, one of the things that the Shapiro test is sensitive to is deviations from being symmetrical. And bimodal distributions could be symmetrical. So um, according to the Shapiro test, no evidence it's different. But, uh, you know, if we actually look at it, it doesn't look very Gaussian. So we have to be careful about that. <clears throat> All right, question five. Uh, using the following code, Examine the CO2 data frame and the help file. Boom. And there's a second part to that. Let's just look in the old. Uh, now show the code to select all the columns of the data frame for the rows where the con uh, concentration is equivalent to 350. Then make a good box plot showing the uptake variable as a function of the treatment variable. Um, that is just for the rows where concentration is equivalent to 350. Okay, so we're we're slicing the data set based on uh, one, and I, there are lots of ways to do this. You can use select and B plier in the tidyverse. Of course, I don't use any tidyverse in the boot camp for reasons that um, I have discussed quite a lot in here. There is this bifurcation of um, of the language, and some people think that base R is easier. Some people think that ggplot's easier. What I observe as an instructor, I'm actually I'm actually not positive that one or the other is really easier. But what I am positive of is that I personally can write um, code to do something of good quality with less lines of code using base R. And for that reason, I, I decided the boot camp would be base R. But what I observe is that because we we all Google these days, even myself, I find myself if I want to do something ambitious and I don't have it in my mind what I want to do, I often get an answer to my question in tidyverse. And sometimes I, I take it up, sometimes I don't. But um, when you're learning, when students learn, they often get tidyverse first. So here, here's the non-tidyverse way to do that. I use the which function to slice out the row numbers. You probably saw me testing that that worked. We just look at that variable by itself. <clears throat> it's like a treatment. So re repeating variables. So I've just sliced out the ones that are 350. 
And what we get from the win which function is the row numbers. Where um, the cons variable takes on the value of 350. I put a comma and left the space here in the square brackets for the whole data frame. So I get the whole data frame just with those rows. Notice that the row numbers stay the same. Sometimes that's irritating to me. I was just working on something the other day where that was irritating to me. So I've just I just dumped that. I didn't have to do this, but it did just dump it in a subset um, data frame, which I called sub, and then make a good box plot. So I'm doing update as a function of treatment for my formula. Data is my sub of the data, and I just put some um, just a y axis label C O2 uptake. Now I had to look in the help of sub of C O2 rather to um, find what that unit was. And um, of course, I added the color goldenrod. OK, not too bad. All right. Question six, given the data, I give you the data. Again, it's a copy paste job. I think this is the question where um, you're supposed to make a figure identical to figure one. So we have to look at figure one. So what's going on in figure one? All I've done is I've given Y and X. So one of the things that I, could, I think if you're reading this for the first time, um, you might say, oh, well, which is Y, which is X, but I did stick to the convention um, Y on the Y axis, X on the X axis, so that would be easy to figure out. A lot going on. I've added some titles. I've added some colors and shapes. I've added the regression. I just thought that I forgot to add my, my text of my own regression line there. Um, and some of the sizes. So what is some of the code to do this? So the first thing I've done is I've made a plot. Let's just make my plot and I'll talk you through the pieces of it. The first bit of code is the plot function. Y is a function of X. I've added on those labels exactly like I put them. I've made the color blue exactly like the blue. I noticed that these are little solid squares. So I set the square shape that is solid according to the PCH argument. You didn't see me Google for it because I do. I only use a couple of these. I only use 16 and 15. 16 is a solid circle. 15 is a solid square. And I can memorize them. And I remember number one is an open circle. You know, so you have to remember this stuff. Um, sometimes if you use it all the time, this is one that you just use like literally every time you use R. I noticed that the size of these was a little bit bigger than normal, so I set the size a bit bigger, and I made the axis titles a little bit bigger. That, of course, is relative to the resolution of your monitor or your uh, graphics device, really. So I've made that. Of course, then it has this AB line, a regression line on it. We typically add that with the AB line function in the regression object. I've done it in a kind of sloppy way. Or I, rather than making an intermediate object, I've just passed the regression, colored it red, made it a little bit thicker. Um, that's the one that makes it thicker. LWD is line width, and this is the one line type, LTY. One, the default, is a solid line. Two is a dashed line, and I had noticed that it's a dashed line, so I'll make that. The one I left off is my um, the text of the equation. Get out the coefficients and we can add text. I'm just going to add the text right up here. That's around 1 and around 0.5. So text y equals around 1, text equals around 0 0.5, text, maybe it's text, maybe it's label, I can't remember. I think it's text and uh, it's y equals the coefficients. So I've just made the equation of the line. Y equals um, the intercept, 0 0.59, 0 0.59. Uh, plus the uh, slope times x. I think that's the way I did it. Slope times x. 0 0.467. times x. Okay, and we need to put all that in quotes. Okay. 
There we go. What is uh, text? So I need to look up my. Is it label labels? There we go. Make the whole thing again. It'll look just right. There we go. When I uh, when I forgot the name of the argument, even though I only you know a week ago wrote this two weeks ago, I just hit F1 to bring it up and I just glanced at the. Um, the argument name, which I knew would be there. Thank you seven. <clears throat> Show the code to calculate the residuals for a simple linear regression of Y as a function of X for the data in the previous question. Calculate the mean and standard deviation of the residuals. In comments, report your findings appropriately and briefly interpret them. OK, so you know I, I've already input the data, so all I need to do is remake the linear model object and calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the residuals. Now, if we break down the parts of this, I've got my raw data, y and x. I'll plop them in the regression um, function. I could stop and make an object here. That's the way that we normally would do it. But I was I was working, you know, at pace. And another way to do it is uh, if you make this object on the fly, you can still exploit the name parameter that it um, results in instantly and on the fly. It's, it's quite nice to work this way, and it it's the foundation of that tidyverse way of working with pipes. <clears throat> So all that stuff is not clever stuff that our studio had invented. It's just stuff that um, JJ Allard, CEO of our studio, exploited. Hadley Wickham, data, chief data scientist at our studio, exploited to um, to make a, a cohesive grammar. Um, but here, I've just done it the old-fashioned way with a the um, hash sign and the residuals field that I know will be in that um, that data object for the linear regression. And you might have seen me as an intermediate step, just run it and make sure that I was getting it and I remembered how it worked. And these are just the 10 residual values for the regression of Y on X. So I've just taken that syntax and I've uh, passed it to the mean function. Well, what should the mean of the residuals be? If we look back at our plot, the um, the mean, it, if it's a true linear regression, the mean of all these residuals, there should be an even number below the line and an even number above the line. So it should be pretty close to zero. Um, and it is a quite small number indeed, so close to zero. And then the standard deviation, well, that depends on the scale. This the, On this occasion, it's... Um, it's around 0.76. So, you know, the mean of my residuals is close to zero as it should be. Oops, and I didn't even report them. Yeah, I guess I just reported them in words. Um, the standard deviation is 0 0.76 units because I don't know, I didn't specify what units were there. Okay. Question eight, based on figure two below, relating comments to the degree to which you believe the Excel data set shown but here's the tidy data standards. Be brief, but be as specific as you can. So here's what it is. Um, the problem with this is uh, now this is um, this is a real data set. It's very similar to the data set that I use as an, a bad example on the boot camp. This is actually from a different person, but it's from the same lab it's from the same supervisor <laughs> so i see a pattern forming here um, another bad example here um, because it's got embedded stuff in the data frame it's got embedded summary statistics and um, uh, pictures it's got um, you know most of it is pretty good uh, it's got uh, things organized by rows and columns individual observations organized by rows um, but it has like the mortality percentage is too big. Can't quite tell. I didn't give enough information to see whether there was a data dictionary there. So there are a few problems. It's definitely not in tidy format. It's definitely not in best practice. So my way of summarizing it is that the 
The data appear to be arranged in rows and columns. The figures and descriptive statistics should not be present. At least one column is uh, probably, uh, at least one column name is probably too long. It contains a space. Verdict, it's a misdemeanor, but not in tidy data format. Okay, and then question nine is the last real analysis question. This is to perform a one-way analysis of variance to evaluate the overall effect of insect spray type spray on the number of insects counted count for the insect sprays data set. Show your code and briefly summarize and interpret your results and comments. Also, show the code to make a good and appropriate graph. So what we're doing here is doing a summary on an OVA table of the uh, of a one way analysis of variance. And we're going to report that back. And we're also going to make a box plot. That's the appropriate graph type for um, for a one way analysis of variance. So I load up the data in sex sprays. Um, <clears throat> now, the way that I've chosen to do this is um, I've chosen to use the AOV function. So analysis of variance, as you know, is a specific kind of linear model, but you can use the LM function here. And then I've chosen to summarize it with the summary function. Specified my formula, just like in the question, count as a function of spray. And uh, the data I've specified is the data set in question. So if we do it, we do get a little summary um, ANOVA table here. Of course, I, I could have put this in ANOVA format and get a um, exactly the same thing for um, for a one-way analysis of variance. Uh, if you note, the um, results are not exactly the same for these. Now, I'm not going to go into why that is, but I do cover this in in the stats class, the master stats class in the linear model lecture. But it's one of the little idiosyncrasies of um, of R, just a minor detail, but it's there. Uh, we can see there's a highly significant effect. Box plot. You want a box plot here. I've just added um, the formula, the uh, data specification. Of course, this is just exactly the same as, as up here. I've added Y label, X label, and of course, I've made the graph perfect with the colored goldenrod. And uh, my summary is that the mean insect count is different for different sprays in the insect sprays data. And I've done this um, in a, the tersest way possible. Could have said one way ANOVA, but I've just said ANOVA F. I've specified the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, just like we, we must for full reporting for ANOVA and the F value. And then the P is very small, the smallest. Um, value there are reports so you know essentially zero but we know when the p value is less than one ten thousandth we always report it as less than one ten thousandth now that's as far as i got there is a tenth question let's have a look so the tenth question is um a lot of students i noticed in the boot camp that they'll go through the um there are three modules in the boot camp you know one module <clears throat> is basic R programming. The second module is basic statistics, old fashioned statistics. I think I'm going to change that and make it a little funnier. Statistics usually aren't that funny, are they? But I'm going to I think I'm going to call it something like 100 year old statistics or something like that because they are all 100 years old or so. Uh, but then there is a third module that's uh, reproducible practice and um, and reproducible collaborative tools. So there's one on um, GitHub and there's one on Markdown uh, on there. So for this question, I kind of combine that last module, a couple of tasks. It's to, now that you've answered all the questions, create a GitHub repository called Bootcamp, create an HTML R Markdown. Um, now I've specified this is exactly what we do in that Bootcamp page create an HTML R markdown doc with your complete answer to question nine in it, showing both the code and the graph output. Push your R markdown file, your HTML file, and other related files to your new repository. Your answer to this question should simply be 
a commented HTML link to your new GitHub repository. So uh, I didn't get to that in the 30 minutes, but um, if you want to look at mine, um, this is the R script I I loaded up here with my my answers to all of these, um, and I do have a GitHub page I made earlier. So I'll just copy this and we can visit it real quick. So um, so here it's just on my personal page, and the repo name is Bootcamp. I did make a README. Um, I could have put the whole shebang in there, although I, this is beyond the question. But uh, the README is just the name of the repo, and in it I do have um, the R markdown, so we could look at it. And it just uh, looks like this. It's the default document, but I changed the the YAML header. Um, it's the default setup chunk. <clears throat> It's got question 10 with the question. It's got uh, my loading the data and uh, my ANOVA with the output. Then it's got my statement of the, um, the results. Then it's got another code chunk with box plot, another section and code chunk with my box plot. So let's see, I don't think that the HTML, no, it won't show. Have a look at the raw. No, we won't load up. But anyway, that's exactly what I asked for. Comments. Too easy? Too hard? Just about right? Fun? Very hard to do against the clock. It is hard to do against the clock. I know this would be fast. It was easy for me because, you know, I wrote the questions and all of that. So. <laughs> is it too easy to um, give them 24 hours? Is that too easy? So maybe I should do it more rigorously. More questions, harder questions, or is that about right? No, I think I think that's fine. I mean, if they, you know, I mean, the whole idea is that you want them to have looked at the boot camp, and if that's where they go to find the answers, that you know they can do that during the module, can't they? So that's not a problem. You certainly can. So this is kind of a serious pedagogical reason that I went to the trouble of doing the boot camp and doing the assessment is that um, this this data science masters is there's a technical jargon term to describe it in terms of pedagogy, and that's that it's a um, it's a conversion course. The government would call it a conversion course, and um, it by conversion course, it means you take students with one <clears throat> background, say in biology or agriculture or ecology, and you rapidly skill them up. Usually this is for technical courses and examples of popular successful kinds of conversion courses are um, like uh, teachers are probably school teachers are probably the biggest one where you would take somebody that has a biology first degree and then teach them just just enough to go and be qualified to teach in school. So teach them some techniques, teach them that. Of course, there's an idea that you can do this in engineering, but it's there are some challenges in engineering because um, you start um, students off on a course like this, they put their life on hold, they take time off their job, they borrow money, um, and then what if they? it's different than what they thought and they uh, all the students coming in Will be at different places. Some might be better in math. Some might have absolutely none. Some might have had a good statistics class recently. Some will have none. Some may just find it real difficult. And so best practice dictates that um, you you attempt to support those students by skilling them up rapidly. And nobody told me I had to do this. I just knew it was the best thing to do. I really appreciate that feedback, Harry, and I'm glad you found it useful. But I get that feedback almost ubiquitously, and my colleagues like it as well. Some of them have taken it and like to take it. And so uh, that's why I do it. But the point is exactly to see if they have engaged with it in some ways. So uh, that's it. That's all I've got, guys.
um, I encourage you to, um, you know, finish it for fun. If you like these little quizzes, we will have another quiz before the uh, beginning of the school term. So maybe we could do another session like this, or maybe even we could have a session where we write questions. Um, if you're interested in that, it's looking at the problems and answers in a different in a different way from a different perspective. That's all I've got. Any final comments? I'm just going to stop the recording.